Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ira Idol, and welcome to my, my multi-part history lesson on the neurodiversity movement. So be before, I want, um, before I really get into the meat of things, in, into the actual history, I'd like to go over some basic things first. So first off, what is neurodiversity? So neurodiversity is short for neurological diversity. It's a similar concept to biodiversity in that there are a lot of different uh, living organisms on this planet. Uh, with neurodiversity, it says that uh, that brain-based disabilities like autism, ADHD, Tourette's, etc., are there um, are natural variations of the human brain, um, and. The term itself was coined by uh, Australian autistic sociologist Judy Singer uh, in her master's thesis in 1998. Uh, so her idea was that, just, um, so yeah, the, the, her thought about these brain-based disabilities being a natural variation of the brain was, um, was contrary to a lot of thoughts about those disabilities at the time. Um, she never in exactly intended for it to become a social movement, though. But she did try. She did want to say that uh, that these disabilities were natural. So, what does neurodiversity include? Neurodiversity is an umbrella term, uh, so that it, it includes any kind of di uh, brain-based disability. So, autism, ADHD, Tourette's, dyslexia, mental illnesses learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and more. Uh, autism is usually the, the disability associated most commonly with neurodiversity, um, and there are a lot of different reasons for that that we'll get into, but it does include any kind of brain wiring that is considered deviant from nor the norm. But, so the term neurodivergent uh, was coined, um, uh, it, it refers to how, to, to somebody's brain wiring being different from what is considered normal. So neurodiversity is the idea that there are a lot of different brain wirings out there that are natural variations of the human brain. Uh, neurodivergent refers to, um, a specific person whose brain wiring is different from normal. The term itself was coined, but pictured here, a uh, longtime autistic activist, Cassiana Asasamas. Uh, it's different from neurodiverse, and it was developed, uh, she coined it independently from uh, Judy Singer. Uh, I don't know if there was ever inter an interaction between the two, or if, I believe uh, Cassiana first uh, started using the term neurodivergent um, online in, the, in 1999, which would be one year after Judy Singer's uh, thesis ab about neurodiversity. I'm not, I'm not sure if, if, if one was inspired by the other, but um, they are two different words that were coined by two different people. Now, neurodivergent is different from neurodiverse, which you hear a lot. Uh, neurodiverse refers to just a, a, any group of people in which there is a lot of variation in brain wiring. So a group of all neurotypical people, all autistic people, all people with ADHD, those are not neurodiverse groups. Uh, neurodiverse would be if a group of six people had two neurotypical people, two autistic people, and two people with ADHD. That would be neurodiverse. Though, honestly, I personally don't use the term neurodiverse very much. I, I just, um, I, I prefer the term neurodivergent, but I also, uh, I also think, um, it's better to, you can even just say people with cognitive disabilities or brain-based disabilities. Uh, it, there's been a lot of debate about who counts as neurodivergent and who doesn't. Uh, so here's a Twitter thread from Cassiana from a few months ago where she talks about this um, and she talks about how there oh, okay how there are people who have gatekept um, who counts as neurodivergent and who doesn't and 
she's basically saying here that that's not okay. Uh, there are people who have tried saying that complex post-traumatic stress disorder doesn't count as neurodivergent when she points out how she coined the term neurodivergent because um, she um, she had multiple brain-based disabilities. So she was, she's autistic and she also has CPTSD um, and she has epilepsy, among other things. Um, And there's also, she points out how, I don't see this very often, but neuroatypical is also used um, as a stand-in for neurodivergent. And when reading it out, it, it doesn't, there's very little difference because it's just one letter that can easily, uh, you can easily glance over. So I I think it's it's best to say neurodivergent or people with brain-based disabilities. Um, rather than the other terms I've talked about. The neurodiversity movement is part of the disability rights movement, which includes all of these uh, sub-movements, so independent living, deaf movement, blind movement, disability justice, the self-advocacy movement, the MAD movement, and, of course, yeah, there's the neurodiversity movement. All of these movements have their own histories, their own leaders, influencers, etc. Uh, but at the same time, there is cross-pollination between these movements. They're not all completely independent of one another, and they do often work in tandem with one another. So autism and neurodiversity. So autism, has, like I alluded to earlier, autism has always been considered the centerpiece of the neurodiversity movement. And there are a few reasons for that. Uh, I, I think one of those reasons is because the person who coined the term neurodiversity was autistic. The person who coined the term neurodivergent was autistic. And I, I, I just think that the whole I, idea of neurodiversity came from autistic people. And that's just who it's not because of that. It's been naturally associated the most with autistic people and autistic people have been, we've been the ones leading the neurodiversity movement for several decades now. It, uh, the neuro, if you do some research on the internet, you, you will find that you'll also see the term autism rights movement. I think that term was used more in the early days, uh, perhaps before the term neurodiversity was either was coined and or was popularized. Uh, so that was just kind of a temporary name it was given. It's it's something I very rarely see people call it nowadays. So it's best just to call it the neurodiversity movement. The infinity symbol is a symbol that, so its origins can be traced back to 2004 when the autistic-led website forum Aspies for Freedom uh, used it in their logo. It may have come before then, but at, that is the earliest instance of it that I can find. The, so the rainbow infinity symbol, I think, came before the gold infinity symbol, uh, the gold infinity symbol is for autism specifically uh, because the color gold has often been associated with autism by autistic people because the chemical symbol for gold uh, is AU, which are, of course, the first two letters of autism. And uh, so the, the gold symbol is for autism specifically. So for, for nothing more, nothing less. The rainbow infinity symbol is for all neurodiversity. And it's still appropriate to use it if you're talking about autism specifically, since, of course, autism falls under the umbrella of neurodiversity. When did it start? The neurodiversity movement, uh, at least from what we know, uh, can be traced back to the late 80s and the early 90s. Uh, the, uh, so autistic people, so autism was had been a diagnosis for a while. There was a lot of debate and still is debate on what exactly causes autism. But um, regardless of that, autistic people started meeting each other. 
Um, of course, autistic people have existed since the beginning of time, but now there was a name for it, and there were people who had grown up with that autism diagnosis, and they were starting to meet each other, mainly at autism conference hosted by parents of autistic people and professionals who studied autism for a living. You're going to see me refer to them as parents and professionals a lot in these lessons. Um, so autistic people didn't uh, have the same desires as, uh, as the non-autistic people had for them. They, uh, so there was some conflict between autistic people and parents and professionals at these conferences and, and in, um, an, on email forums. I'm going to get more into that in the next few parts. Um, but that was, yeah, what really sparked the, the movement is that, that autistic people didn't really like how they were being talked about and framed. So they, they wanted... And they, they wanted more of a say in how they were spoken about. And there were, excuse me, there were just, there were conf conflicting ideologies because of that. Autistic people wanted their own spaces that they were in charge of to, and to do, to help things, to help each other with things. Um, and a lot of the organization of the neurodiversity movement, so back then was online, and even now in 2021, is still online. Uh, pictured here, by the way, is Autism Network International, which was the first, or at least one of the first, autistic-led organizations that were like part of this movement specifically. And these two, these two pins um, were uh, made by the organization. So why online of all places? So. The internet has historically been a really good place for autistic people to gather and meet each other, even if it isn't for autism-specific stuff, because the internet is, is just, the way it's designed is very naturally helpful to a lot of autistic people. It levels the playing field for communication, because there are some autistic people who are fully verbal, some who are, uh, who can speak, or fully speaking, I should say, some who are semi-speaking, some who are completely non-speaking, and um, everyone using a keyboard to uh, to interact with each other, uh, to, or just using text, is um, a way of um, equalizing communication. Uh, you can also choose when to enter and when to walk away a lot more easily than you can in in-person spaces. Uh, it's also easier to control who you interact with. So if there's, uh, if there's like a specific group of people or one person you want to talk to something about, you can either create a like a smaller group for those people or uh, message them one on one, and that that saves a lot of hassle that would cause in real life. And, Um, it, it's also, um, it's, it's also, it's easier to, uh, to, to really, uh, curate who you spend your time with, who you interact with online than it is in person. It also allows for time to gather thoughts before communicating them. And that's really important. Now, of course, there are still people uh, that, there are a lot of instances in which people will uh, will type, will send a message on the internet before they really think about the ramifications of it. In fact, the fact that it's behind a screen rather than face to face creates a completely different dynamic. However, it's still you can you can edit your thoughts in real time when typing a message out versus when you're talking. Oh, when, when you're talking to someone face-to-face uh, -face, uh, with, with your mouth. Who are the leaders? Pictured here is a painting of three prominent autistic advocates uh, from left to right. They're Marina K. Giwa Onaiwu, Lydia X. Z. Brown, and E. Ashkenazi. I believe this 
paint this was drawn by Finn Gardner uh, so the so there isn't like a single leader or lord or what have you of the neurodiversity movements so in that sense it is decentralized however there are plenty of people who uh, whose opinions and their their speeches and whatnot have been heavily influential on the movement um, that a lot of people look up to for different reasons, uh, but there isn't there isn't like a single leader of the neurodiversity movement, as with any kind of social movement. Um, there is also you also somebody doesn't have to be considered a leader to be important. Uh, if no matter where you are, no matter how big or small your audience or your reach is, if you're if you take the message, the central the messages and ideas of the neurodiversity movement, and you're able to influence change, even just with one single person, that matters. It all counts. Many advocates have come and gone over the years. The neurodiversity movement is relatively new, only about 30 years, but there are a lot of people from the early days who are no, either no longer advocating, they just decided they didn't want to do the advocacy anymore, or they, uh, they, um, they might have passed away. Uh, autistic people tend to have shorter lifespans than non-autistic people for a lot of different reasons. Um, or because uh, because they uh, their access to the internet um, was restricted um, for any any different kinds of any different reasons. Um, oh, so there there are still people from the early days who are active who are still alive, uh, but um, it the. The, the, I guess the, the, the prominent advocates, it seems like that they keep kind of swapping out every few years or so because I think um, there are advocates who, there are people who, you know, they, they do their stuff, they, uh, and then they maybe, they, they just, they decide that they've had enough and that they would rather, they would rather pass the torch on to newer advocates who um, who deserve who, who deserve that time and space? Um, the main conflicts of the neurodiversity movement uh, include, um, but I guess aren't exactly limited to, uh, who are the real experts on autism? Are they parents of autistic people? Are they professionals who study autism for a living? Excuse me. Or are they autistic people themselves? And of course, you can be autistic and a parent, an autistic person and a professional. You could be all three of those at once. But generally speaking, there are those two different camps of, or I guess three, of autistic people, parents of autistic people, and professionals. What causes autism, as I talked about earlier, that's been the subject of a lot of debate. It was once thought... And there are people who still think this, that autism was caused by um, unaffectionate parenting, by refrigerator mothers. Uh, and it was, it's also been thought that autism is caused by a leaky gut. Uh, and of course, most infamously, there's the belief that vaccines cause autism. And all, all three of these have been disproven. Autism is present from birth it is genetic it is a wiring of the brain um so um so that is how autistic people come to be now how specifically uh those genes come to be i think is still being talked about though there is definitely um there that the, is definitely a very very thin thread to need to needle through um, yeah, to needle through, uh, be, because of the discussion of, well, if we find out what exactly causes autism, 
could that lead to eugenics? Could that lead to selective abortion? And I'm not going to get into that conversation right now, but that is, yeah, very much an important uh, an important part of the autism discourse. What treatments are appropriate, if any? Uh, should autism is autism something that doesn't even need like um, any kind of treatment? Are there just co-occurring conditions that autistic people often have that? You know, those things should be addressed, but the autism itself should be left alone. And what kind of, what specific practices are okay and which ones aren't? Who gets to call themselves autistic? So, for example, I'm what a lot of people would say, would call high functioning. Meaning that like, oh, I can speak. I can um, I can go to college and graduate. I I I can wash myself. Uh, I can dress myself, etc. So does that mean I'm really autistic? Like um, because there are autistic people who can't do those things, and um, it's yeah. Again, it's led to a lot of debate, and I I personally think it's not really. Um, an import, I, I don't think it's productive for us to go back and forth between who's autistic and who's really autistic. There's also a lot of debate about is self-diagnosis okay or, or are you only autistic if you have a professional diagnosis? And I, I certainly have my opinions on that. I think self-diagnosis is perfectly valid for a lot of different reasons. But I, yeah, I think if you're autistic, you're autistic. And of course, there's no one kind of autistic person, but I, I don't think like just because one autistic person is real is different from another autistic person doesn't mean like only one of them is really autistic, you know. And then, as I've talked about many times, and I'm going to talk about many times after this, autistic advocates versus non-autistic parents and professionals who whose opinion counts more, I guess. So, uh, here are a few things, a few questions I want you, get, want you to ask yourselves um, as we move forward with this. Was this movement inevitable with autistic people meeting each other? What, were they inevitably going to uh, start a movement for, um, for better treatment and for um, to advocate for, for people like them to live better lives? Um, or was it just a chance happening? What parts of the world has the movement reached? Um, and what I mean by this really is like, what parts of the world have had the most influence on the neurodiversity movement? Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, and perhaps what parts of the world has it not reached and why? What is good about the neurodiversity movement, and in what ways do you think it could improve from what you know? And depending on who you are watching this, you could you, you either might know a lot about the neurodiversity movement, including very intimate details. You could also be brand new to the neurodiversity movement, and that's okay. I'm still I would still be curious as to what um, your thoughts are on on these, on all of these. So that's all for now. Um, the, this presentation, I took, I took a lot of the structure of the presentation from, uh, from a presentation the Autistic Self Advocacy Network gives to college students in their Autism Campus Inclusion program, which is also, an, well, it's, it's called what is disability, but a lot of it is an introduction. the 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 four one one of the neurodiversity movement, or a four one one, I should say. And a lot of the graphics I I used um were assembled on Canva, and um I got them from the elements section. There are of course like the pictures of and the A and I logo and those pins I found on Google Images. Um, and the the yeah the Rainbow and golden infinity symbols I also found 
Um, I actually, I think I found those in the elements section too. So all due credit goes to their original creators. So I'm Ira Idol. Thank you for watching. And I will be back with more neurodiversity history.